Welcome to my lecture, and thank you for the nice introduction. So I'm from the center campus here in Munich. I moved there a couple of months ago. So what I will showing today is not work that has been done at Munich, but at ETH Zurich, where I was previously, and I will explain the concepts in there. But this work will also continue here, but so far there are no new results from this area here, so this is where I will show you results from ETH Zurich there, and also explain how these things work there. So my topic is autonomous micro aerial vehicles, and what I didn't write in here is that I'm working with cameras, and also the methods that I explain here, they are based on cameras. So what do I mean with autonomous micro aerial vehicles and autonomous operations? So imagine you have a setting like this and you would like to put a micro aerial vehicle in there, a small one, and you switch it on and it should explore the environment and create the map and give back a map to the user. So in here, it's between a lot of buildings GPS reception will not be good, so you can't rely on GPS there. You need to use a different method of post estimation and control of the helicopter. Also, there are a lot of obstacles, so the helicopter needs to sense all these obstacles, and then it doesn't know the map, it doesn't know anything, so it needs to create the map, and it needs to find out where it can go, and then go there and explore the environment. So in we created such a system, and we put it in there, and we switched it on, and in the following video, i show you what happened then and what the helicopter did. Okay, so this is our MAV. It's very small. It was switched on and then it was immediately starting to explore free space. It went into this direction and there it was blocked by these two colleagues, so it had to turn back and went in the opposite direction again. Here you see all the internals visualized of this MAV. You see the 3D map, you see its path planning, you see its sensor input. So the sensor input consists of a stereo camera system that is looking front. You can see it on the left side, you can see an image. On the right side, you could see the depth map of it. So now you can see the MAV again exploring the free space and filling up all the unknown areas that it might have missed before. This is a grid map, so this represents obstacles, and the different colors represent different heights. The blue ones are actually on the floor, so the helicopter can fly over them. Uh, the more warmer colors are higher up, so these rep represent obstacles for the helicopter. It cannot go there. It will stop in front of them. So an after operation, uh, it will return such a map, and it also can be visualized as a point cloud that is colored in, in full detail. So this was a small experiment that I showed you. This was our system that we built with all the software that we built. And in the following slides, I will tell you how this system works and what you need to build such a system. So in particular, I will talk first about the MAV system itself. Then I will talk about the method for pose estimation based on optical flow. Then I will explain how the 3D mapping for navigation was done in our system. And then I will explain the navigation. And here I will explain two concepts, the exploration, it's a frontier-based exploration, and the local navigation, how to go to certain points in space. Okay, but now let me start with the MAV system. So this is one of our systems. Uh, we have different kinds of systems. This one is fully built from ourselves. We also use others where we use the frame and build our own electronics. But what really is different with our systems, we have custom-made electronics in there. So the frame and the motors, they are not that important. They can easily be exchanged. What we really put in there is our custom-made electronics, like for instance the a microcontroller. This one is a lower level microcontroller that controls really the, con the, 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 the does the control of the helicopter. And then we put another computer on top. This is a Linux flight computer. It's like a laptop PC but very small scale and quite powerful. Also very important is an IMU and an altitude sensor. This is very important sensor information for control and stable flight of the helicopter. And then 
For obstacle detection and navigation, we have cameras. We have a front-looking stereo camera system. And for position control, we have a downward-looking optical flow camera. So this is basically another camera that is looking down and has an, a small computer attached to it, another microcontroller that does off-board processing or that, that does embedded processing of this sensor data in here. So this is our system, and even if it looks different on some videos, uh, the main, then just the frame is different, but the main parts are still the same. And these are actually the hardware components that you need to build an autonomous micro-aerial vehicle. Um, one other thing, so this hardware is open source. So the, the, the schematics, the electronic schematics, they can all be downloaded from this web page, from the Pixhawk web page, and you can recreate and rebuild it yourself. So we uh, developed a couple of custom-made onboard electronics that, made, that allows our system to do the full autonomous task. And also this, these components have been made open source and you can also recreate it yourself. So one very important part is the computer, the flight computer. So for this we bought a computer board, but this board doesn't have any connectors. So if you would like to use such a computer board, you need to develop your own board that brings connectors. So this is what we developed, and you can put this on, on top of this, and then you will have a lot of connectors and access to the computing board. Uh, we have several different types. We have an Intel Core to do and a more modern i7. So they are quite powerful computers. It's like a, a small laptop in there. So this is really a very strong computing platform and you can do a lot of image processing. And especially for image processing, you need a lot of computing power. And another very important uh, component is our IMU, our inertial measurement unit. So here we built our own IMU. It's a microcontroller, an ARM microcontroller. It has 3D gyroscopes, accelerometers, and a compass, air pressure sensor, and it does the control. And also very important, it triggers the cameras, it synchronizes our cameras. So this is a very important behavior. So in our sit setup, the images of the cameras and the, and the IMU measurements, they are really synchronized. So this is very different to other systems where you attach a camera via USB and you don't know when the images are taken. So in our system, we know when the images are taken. And if you want to have such a behavior, you can rebuild this system and then you have it also. So these have been the hardware components. And now I would like to show you the system architecture, the software components of it. So basically in here you see all the software components that you would need for a micro aerial vehicle, for an autonomous micro aerial vehicle. So we have three main parts. We have the higher level Linux flight computer, we have the lower level controller, and we have the sensors here. We have also the motors here. So the lower level, the controller, is quite similar to any other MAV that is created, also to the ones that you can buy. If you buy them from Aztec, if you have the AR drone, you would have a similar low level controller. This one really controls the, how the MAV will fly. So the most important part here, I would say, is the attitude controller. This really steers the helicopter. So if you have a helicopter, an a quadrotor, and you would like to move it, you have to tilt it. So you have to change the attitude. And then the helicopter will go into this direction. If it should be stable, the attitude should be zero. And this is controlled by this attitude control. This is a really important part of the helicopter. This is the low-level steering of it. If you buy such a helicopter and you fly it yourself via remote control, you give commands to the attitude controller. You set the angles of the helicopter. If you set strong angles, it will go fast. If you set small angles, it will go slow. And if you want the helicopter to stand still, then you need to have set zero in there. And if the measurements of the attitude are very precise, and there's no wind and no external force, the helicopter will stand still. 
very important for this attitude controller, or the only measurements for this, are the IMU measurements. They go into this attitude controller. And usually the problem is, it will not stand still. There is a lot of noise on these measurements, and usually you have wind outside, inside, you have turbulences created from their own engines. So in most cases, the helicopter will not stand still. But to create this, you usually need a position controller in there. So this one doesn't control the tilting of the helicopter, but it tells you the position that the helicopter should be. And for instance, the position could be the set point zero, it's not moving, or you could set other waypoints where the helicopter should go. This is also very important. This position controller goes directly into the attitude controller and defines the steering commands for the helicopter. To a, for a position controller to work, you need to have more measurements than just the IMU measurements. You need to have position measurements of the helicopter in X, Y, Z. And this is actually tricky to get, and to get this, you need all the rest, basically, here. So what we have in here to compute the position is the stereo cameras, the optical flow cameras, and the ultrasonic sensor. And a lot of very high-level, time-consuming image processing also. So here you can see the stereo cameras. We need to do stereo processing. We need to do visual odometry. And this goes into a pose estimator just to have the helicopter fly, hover, fly at the same position. And if you would like to have a helicopter explore, then you need to one, have one more step. You need to have an artificial intelligence or a planning algorithm, some, something that tells the helicopter, now go into this direction or go into this direction. And in, for, for such a planner, you also need to do to, to map creation, create a representation of the environment that tells you where is actually free space, where are obstacles, and where you can go safely. In our system, we have a, a permanent downlink to a ground station, so data is always transmitted. So while the helicopter is flying, you can do a lot of computations on your ground station. The images will be streamed down, features will be streamed down, and you could do full slam and loop closure. This is on an offline PC that is still much stronger than the onboard PC. Yes. Yes. So the position controller is a simple PAD controller. So we can't do much more on this processor, but this is working fine. The attitude controller runs with 2,000 hertz. This is also fine. Um, other systems, like the Aztec, runs with 1,000 hertz, which seems to work or should work better, but it doesn't make a big difference from our experience. Okay. okay, the next steps now is I'm um, explaining the hovering and or the autonomous flight. So here with autonomous flight, I mean hovering or flying to a certain waypoint that is set. And as already mentioned, this is basically done by the position controller. And for this, the position controller needs input of the optical flow camera and of the stereo camera. So both of them deliver the same measurements, but with different certainties or uncertainties. So it would be possible to use just this or use just this. So in the following, I'm explaining how the position measurement from the optical flow camera are computed and how you use this for the position control. So again, the most important sensor for position control in our case are the stereo camera and the optical flow camera. And you can use either one or you can use combine them for Im improved position accuracy. So now I would like to explain you this optical flow idea. And actually, you might know this already, the Parrot AR drone has a similar thing installed. And this is why it can hover that nicely. Without this optical flow camera, it wouldn't work like this. And we created uh, a custom-made module for the optical flow sensor because we also wanted to have this in different MOVs, not just the pair of the Artron. And we wanted to have access to the, all the measurements of this thing. 
So for the optical flow concept or idea to work, there need to be a couple of assumptions. The most important assumption is that you need to have a planner scene. You need to have a downward looking camera and you need to look at the flat ground. So you are not, there shouldn't be any obstacles in there. It really has to be flat and actually it also has to be normal to the earth gravity field. So this is also an assumption in there. In this case, the camera that is mounted in there uh, should be plane, should be parallel to the ground plane. So the camera plane should be parallel to the ground plane. If this is the case and you move the helicopter in X and Y direction, then you can measure pixel shifts and these pixel shifts directly correspond to the motion of the helicopter in X and Y. So if the helicopter looks like this and you move it left and right, then you measure optical flow in the image in the X and Y and this shifts of pixels in X and Y directly correspond to the motion of the helicopter. Now you have this in pixel, but if you know the height of the helicopter over the plane in meters, then you can transform these pixel shifts into shifts in meters on the ground plane. And this is actually your motion of the helicopter in meters. But for this, you need to measure this distance. And you need an additional sensor that is able to do this. You can do this with ultrasound or with infrared, but you need an altitude sensor that tells you how much you are over the ground. So I'm now going a little bit more into detail how this works. So this illustrates a simple setup. So this is actually the camera center. And this one, this line here is the image plane. So the distance between the camera center and the image plane is the focal length f. And the width of this image plane is Sx. Or actually the, the half width here. With a certain field of view, you would see this scene of the real world in, the, in your image. And the distances here are marked with GX. So these are the distance in meters of the plane that you see. And we also need to know the distance between the camera center and this plane, and this is written as H. So now one could, can easily see that the distances in the image the x and y distances are directly related to the distances on the ground. And this is, can, you can see this by comparing similar triangles. You have this triangle and this triangle, and you can easily write up this equation. So the ratio between gx and h, between this side of the triangle, up is the same between the sx durch f, the focal length. So this is here, so the smaller triangle. You can preformulate this to get the distances in meters on the ground, and this is just Sx divided by F times H. So Sx divided by F times H. If you know all these values, Sx, F, and H, you can transform any measurements in pixel directly in measurements in meters. And if the image plane is parallel to the ground plane, and if the motion of the camera center of the helicopter is only X and Y, then you can transform this optical flow measures or this pixel measures directly into the measures of the helicopter, into the movements of the helicopter. So this is the basic idea. It tells you when you have a calibrated camera, this means you know the field of view, you know the focal length, and if you know the height over ground and you look at flat ground, then you can compute the motion of the helicopter in meters from optical flow or from pixel shifts. And this relation can also be written in, in terms of the tangents of this angle here. Okay, so here, so this was the general concept and here is one more step. So here I illustrated how it looks like when you move the helicopter. So we have the first position, this is the camera at the first position, and this camera is rigidly attached to the helicopter. When the helicopter moves, the camera is moving over there. 
In this simple scenario, I kept all the assumptions, so they're all valid now. So we, I only moved in x and y direction. The distance between the camera center and the ground plane, h1 and h2, is still the same. And there was no rotation in there. So the, the rotation is identity, and the translation doesn't have a set component also. It was just going in the plane. Then you can mes measure optical flow in the images, shifts in pixel. And with this equation, you can directly transform them into shifts on the ground plane in meters. So h, h1, h2 is, is the same. This is h. And then you can directly compute the distance in meters. And this is actually directly the movement of the helicopters. This is this t vector here. This is the ideal case, but I can tell you a helicopter doesn't move like this. That's the problem. If you want to move, you have to tilt it. So this is what I told you. So a movement like this is not possible. The helicopter has to be tilted. There is rotation involved. And all these assumptions are not true anymore. But actually, this is not a problem, because you can measure the deviations from this original assumption. And then you can apply these deviations and can compute, or you can correct the solution that you get with these deviations. And this is what I would like to show you here. So now, the actual case is that the helicopter is moving like this. It tilts, so there is a rotational component in here. And it also might change height, so it will go up a little bit. So the translation is not just in a plane. Actually, this is the nice behavior on a helicopter that you can go up also. You don't need to fly in one plane at one height. So this rotation has some other problem. It will change the distance reading. So again, this distance, h1, is measured by a sensor, like an infrared or ultrasound sensor. If you rotate the helicopter, it measures this distance. But actually, you would like to have this distance measured. But there's still one assumption that is true. It's the assumption that we look at the flat ground. And this makes it possible, or this relates the image from position one very simply to image from position two. And actually, you can transform the image from position one directly into image two without any loss. And you really can compute how it would look like if this is a flat plane. If there would be 3D objects sticking out, then you couldn't do it. But if you know this is really flat, then you can transform the image that you have from position one. You can transform it into position two. And this is actually written up there. You can do this by the means of a homography, homography age. You can multiply image one with the homography, or you actually, here you can apply a transformation based on homography age on image one. And then you get image two. This homography is a three by three matrix. And if you write, this is actually the correct equation. If you write it in pex pixels and locations on the image plane, x, y, and z, then you can do it like this. You can get the new position of this pixel by multiplying this three by one vector with h, which is a three by three matrix. So again, this only holds if this is flat and flat plane. But this also means that you can retransform the second image into the same coordinate system as the first one, such that you only have x and y pixel shift in there. And then you can do the original optical flow idea and optical flow measurements. And this is actually what you can do. And for this, we need to look at the homography and how it is computed. So the homography, I told you the matrix H is a 3 by 3 matrix. And it can be very easily computed from rotation and translation that is involved in this motion. And from knowledge about the plane here. So this homography H consists of R, which is a rotation matrix, plus 1 over D times T and N transposed. So the components here, like R, R is a rotation matrix. It's the rotation matrix of the transformation of the movement of the camera. And this is a 3 by 3 matrix. Uh, 
Are you familiar with this formulation or with this equation already? Did you have this in other computer vision classes? No? Yes? <laughs> okay. So this is the rotation, it's a 3 by 3 matrix. T is the translation vector normalized to 1. And N is the normal vector of the plane. So it's this vector normal to the plane. And for our case, this is actually a vector in Z direction. It's 0, 0, 1. So this is based on our assumption that we have flat ground. So N is over 0, 0, 1 in there. And D is the distance between the camera center and the ground plane. So th the nice thing actually is that we know most of these components in there from additional sensors. We know the rotation matrix from the gyroscopes of the helicopter. If we move from here to here, we measure the rotations that are involved with the gyroscopes. And these are pretty, pretty much precise. What we also know is this D value. We know this from our altitude sensor, from a sonar or infrared sensor. And we know the normal vector n here of the plane, because we assume it's a flat plane. So this means the only unknown is the actual movement of the helicopter. And actually, it's only unknown in x and y, because the height change is also measured with this d. Because we assume that the plane is not moving, but the helicopter is moving. So this means we can actually, we can correct our image here with all the values we know already. And then we have created a new image that only shows x and y movements. And then we can compute optical flow in there. And this is actually the x and y movement of the helicopter. And we can do this in, oh yes? The starting position is that, that the first camera is, is in this coordinate system. So we are always, so for this, we, we assume that we are in the coordinate system of the world of the plane. That's true. And also, you're right that the helicopter is measuring this, measuring this distance, but we know this rotation from our IMU. We also know it in the, in the world reference frame. So what we have to do is we have to use this measurement and turn it and rotate it to measure this value. So actually, we know this angle. We can do this by simple trigonometric operations. But this is very important to do this correction here. Yes. Yes? How important are the centrifugal and inertial forces? Because we can just create them with the measurements, right? So we should compensate when they measure with the gyroscopes. Well, there will, be, there will be noise, but when you measure the rotation, this is pretty much accurate up to noise. So they, I don't know what you mean with measuring the, the forces in there. What we want to measure is, so we want to measure the, the gyroscope measures the, the angular movements. And this is pretty much accurate, and this is what we need in here. Yes. Oh, this is transposed. So this is a, a column vector, and then this is a, a row vector, and then we need the outer product in here. So we compute that this is an outer product, and this will be a 3x3 three three matrix. So this means you have a 3x3 three three matrix plus a 3x3 three three matrix scaled by D. OK. What I wanted to explain to you now is how to correct this image in two steps. So first, I correct, for instance, the rotation. And then I can correct the height, the height in there. And then I have an image of the same height 
and in the same direction it only have only x and y shift in there. So this is what I mean with correcting the rotation. So I have this one and then I'm rotating it back. So in this rotation can be done by just multiplying every pixel coordinate in here with the homography that only consists of the rotation. And in this case, the homography is really only the rotation matrix. And actually, for correcting, you need to do the inverse rotation. You need to use the inverse rotation here. And this also can easily be seen from this equation, that the homography is just the rotation. For this, we don't change the translation, the camera center. So this means this t vector will be 0, 0, 0. So this means this part will be 0, and our homography is only the rotation of this. So we can apply this homography, we can transform the image with this homography, which is just a rotation, and then we get an image from this position here. And now, the only difference, or what we still know, is this height difference. So the image will be zoomed in or out, depending on the height change of the helicopter. So this is also what you can correct, because now we we measure this distance, we know this distance, and we know the ratio between H1 and H2, and then we can correct for this as well, like this. And for this, we create another homography based on this d value. So in here, the translation vector here, we have a movement only in set direction. This is known. D is the ratio between H1 and H2, and R, is the identity matrix. And this gives a homography that only scales the, the, the image coordinates. So we can apply this homography, then we get an image of this in the same configuration, only with an X and Y shift of the camera centers. And this is actually what we would like to measure. Now we can compute the optical flow between these two images, and we get the optical flow in pixel, and then we transform the optical flow with our equation from before into meters, and we have the motion of the camera, and we have the motion of the helicopter. Okay, was this explanation clear? Okay, that's great. So now, this was the general idea, and we built an electronic component a smart camera that is doing exactly this, that is measuring the optical flow or the optical, the derivative of the optical flow, the speed, in meters. And this was designed as a smart camera module. So this means we devised the module that has a camera on it, an ARM processor, an ultrasound sensor, and has a serial output that outputs the speed and the distance of, the, of this module. And we put this on the helicopter to measure the, the movements of the helicopters. And we wanted to do this with a very high frame rate. So we put the camera on it, it's quite a standard VGA camera with a resolution of 752 times 480. And with this resolution, it will give 60 frames per second. The nice thing about this camera is that if we use hardware binning, so we use less pixel resolution, then we can get higher frame rates. For instance, with a setting of 188 and 120, we get 250 frames per second. This is really fast, and this is very, it's a very useful frame rate for computing optical flow. And this is directly attached to an ARM microcontroller that reads out the images and processes the images also. And we also needed, we added gyroscopes that measures the, ro the rotation of this camera directly, independent of the IMU of the helicopter. So this, this can be attached to any robot that has, for instance, that doesn't have its own IMU. And actually, the nice thing is, you can buy this now. So we found a company that was developing it, so we gave it for them for free. And you can now order it from the company. You don't need to build it yourself. You could also download the schematics, but if you don't want to sold it yourself, you can buy it already sold out from a company. What, what do you do if you fly above, let's say, seven meters when the ultrasonic stops working? That's another assumption that I should have put in my list. You can only 
flying ranges that the ultrasound or infrared sensor or your altitude measurement permits. So usually the pressure sensor is not good enough, it only gives you nice relative measurements, but you need the distance to the ground. So, so this is one weakness of this system. And you're right, up, usually we fly in heights up to, on to, up to four meters where our ultrasound still works. We have another system that consists of two cameras and that is computing stereo from the ground and then you get the scale there as well. But actually this system is bigger, it's a much bigger system and needs much more processing power. And so this is why we prefer this. The alternative would be to use a second camera, but don't do full stereo, but only do stereo on a single pixel to measure the distance of the plane. If you assume it's a plane, then you then this one measurement will hold for all the rest. And, but the problem is that this is, has the same problems. It depends on the baseline how high you can go. And if you want to have a small system, you have a little baseline, then you only can operate in very narrow ranges. Okay, I spent way too much time on this, I think, so I will speed up a little bit. I will skip the details about this computation to be able to explain the, the mapping a little bit. So this was the position estimation, the pose estimation based on optical flow. I think it's an important concept. So this is why I spent quite some time on it. Uh, for autonomous operation, you need a position control, but you also need to have a map of the environment. And actually, you need to create this map while you're exploring the environment. And you need to create the map in a way that the helicopter can use it for navigation. And this is done with a, in a mapping framework. So the input is sensor input from the stereo cameras and the MAV poses that are computed from the pose estimation. This is a very important part in there. And then we create a so-called grid map, a 3D grid map, that shows which areas are occupied and which areas are free. And this is actually what we would like to store in our map. Areas that are occupied and areas that are free, and also areas that are unknown where the sensors didn't come so far. So the helicopter knows he needs to go into unexplored areas. So we, from our sensor input, we create a 3D grid map. And actually, to represent this grid map, we use a multi-volume op occupancy grid. So this is a, a special implementation of a grid map. If you have a 3D grid map, you could think of discretizing all the 3D space, but this would be, cub this would be cubic in, in and memory requirements, which is a, usually a problem, especially on our helicopter. So instead, we use a sort of two and a half D representation, which can represent the same 3D environment, but with less space. So and, uh, the, the idea is that you maintain a grid in X and Y, so you discretize X and Y positions, and then you create linked lists at every position if you have measurements there. So this is very, very nice. If you don't have measurements for certain cells or certain positions of the environment, you don't use up memory in there. Only if you have measurements, you create a linked list of all these measurements. And how this is done uh, is, is, called, is described in the paper about multi-volume occupancy grid. And actually what we store is, we store free and occupied space. And this is how it looks later on. We have, we can, for every point in space, we can have a value if it is free or occupied. And if it's occupied, it is showed as black in here. Or no, as, as blue in here. And you won't see anything if it's free. And this map can be incrementally built. If you have new sensor readings, new measurements, you can update it. And actually, this is, you, here you can see a, uh, a stereo scan represented as lines, and by this scan lines, you, or using this scan lines, you can update your 3D map. What I would like to show you in here is how you will know, or how we can use one measurement to, to determine free space and, and occupied space. If you see a point like this and you measure the distance here, you know that 
in here this point is occupied. So you would like to store this in your map as occupied. But you also know that all the, all the line that can be traced towards this point has to be free now, because otherwise you wouldn't see this point. So this is also why you would like to store the free space, because by measuring this one distance, you know that this one is occupied, and but you also know that all these voxels here, they are actually free. So this is very nice, and this is very important for the helicopter. So if you see an obstacle, you know immediately that everything in front of the obstacle is measured as free. This is where the helicopter can go. And this is, this is one measurement of one pixel in the depth map. In the camera, you measure the depth of this pixel. This means the distance here of this ray. And you know that everything that is the end point is occupied, and all the pixels that cross the ray from the camera position to this depth value is free. And this is what you would like to store in your list. At this position here, at this X and Y position, you add an occupied entry, and on all the others, you add an empty entry in here. And one of the nice things that you can see, uh, one of the nice properties of the multi-volume occupancy grid is that the set direction is continuous. It's not discretized. So we have X and Y discretized in certain steps, but the measurements in set are not. Here we store really the the continuous values of when something is free or occupied. And this is what you see here. If you measure something that is further up, you can see that actually the areas for this pixel that are free are much taller than if you have a lower angle, it's much smaller. So here we really store the on and off values in as float values in here. So and if you have a depth image, we have a lot of measurements in here, and we add all of them into this grid map incrementally and build up the, the map like this. And from this representation, we can then generate probabilities for occupancy and free space. So we can determine a specific coordinate, x, y, z, and we would like to have a probability if this is occupied or not. For this, we go to the x and y coordinate, look through the linked list, and based on all the entries in that measured free space or occupied space there, we compute the probability of occupy or free. And this is actually very nice because if there are wrong measurements, there could be wrong measurements, and a single location has an, has an entry that it's blocked. But we have many, for instance, we could have many entries that say actually this position is free then this would still be a free block, but maybe with a lower probability. So small errors in the measurements do not destroy the whole map. They will be canceled out by multiple measurements in this area. So here's a video that shows how such a map is incrementally built. We have a helicopter flying in our lab. These are the sensor inputs, camera, and the computed depth map. And here's the 3D map that is created from these images, that is stitched together there. You can see that if you come to a new area, new information will be added to the map. And this is now a nice representation for path planning. So this is not a final mapping result. If you would like to have a nice textured 3D model of the environment, you would use a different method. But if you would like to have the helicopter fly around, such a representation is the ideal representation. OK. What I will do now is I will use the last five minutes to, ex to explain the exploration step in there and then skip the one remaining chapter of it. So now we have created a 3D map and now we can do exploration in there. And we have, and there exist different exploration strategies for different types of 3D envi uh, environment representations. And for our grid map, the a very, a very suited exploration 
method is the frontier-based exploration. So this frontier-based exploration is the right method for doing exploration in an, in an occupancy grid map. Frontiers, these are boundaries between known and unknown areas. So in your map, you need to have known areas and unknown areas, and the frontiers in between are these boundaries between these two spaces. And actually, what this exploration does, it, it finds these frontiers and then goes there. And by going into the frontiers, you shift the frontiers further out and you explore more space. And this concept is very simple and it can be viewed at this, in this grid map. So what you see here is, is a slice of a grid map in 2D. Black pixels are occupied pixels. White pixels are free pixels. They are computed as free. And all these gray pixels here they are unknown. So this means we didn't have any sensor readings there. And this could have been multiple reasons. It could have been that this area is blocked by this occupied pixel, so you can't measure it from there. And for other areas, you would see that maybe the, the range of the sensor was not big enough to find something there, so it's also still unknown. And the frontiers here are the colored regions. So these are really the border pixels between the unknown and the known space. And so all these pixels are front frontiers. And if you have a, a, a row of connected pixels that have a certain length, then we say this is a frontier that we would like to explore. So we mark this as a frontier, this as a frontier, and this as a frontier. And then we compute the centroid of these frontiers, like here. And then we set this as a new coordinate for the helicopter. And we send the helicopter in there, if there are no, no obstacles in this way. And this is frontier-based exploration. So we send the helicopter there, then we compute, if we are here, we have new sensor readings, the map looks different, then we compute new frontiers, and then we go there. And we continue this until all the frontiers have been found and until you went to all the frontiers. And in the end, if everything is explored and if, you're, if, if it's a limited space, then there are no frontiers anymore and the operation stops. And a very nice behavior is, if the helicopter started here, then there will be a frontier in the back of it. And if you mark this frontier and if you keep this as the last to explore, then it will come home automatically. And this actually, this is what you have been seeing in the first video in the beginning. This algorithm was used there. Okay, so what I'm not explaining now is how to go to the frontiers, how to compute a way from here to here, and how to fly there. So this, there can be two algorithms. One could be a vector field histogram navigation algorithm, and another could be one based on a state lattice representation, which is actually a graph search to find a nice, smooth connecting path from one position to another, including obstacles. So I'm not going into detail anymore, so I'm now closing my presentation. Okay, I would like to wrap up. So what we learned today, you learned today about system components that are necessary for an autonomous MAV, and they're actually implemented in our MAV. I explained to you how ego motion estimation works when using optical flow sensors. I told you about 3D environment mapping, especially using the multi-volume occupancy grid. And then I also explained the frontier-based exploration. And well, I told you, you can do local navigation with vector field histograms or state lattices. Uh, if you want to know how it works, you can look up the slides, they will be online later. Okay, thank you.